With the Vol 2, Universal Audio brings a vintage look and sound into the interface world. But what exactly does the vintage mode on the Vol 2 sound like? And how does the Vol 2 perform anyways? That's what we're going to find out in this video. Hey, Julian Krauss here, and I just bought the Universal Audio Vaults 2 after an overwhelming amount of comments from you. And of course, we're going to have a detailed look at this interface. As always, I'm going to start out with the hardware first, and then we'll dive into some measurement to evaluate the true audio quality of this interface. Starting on the left, you can find two XLR and TRS combo inputs. Further to the right, stacked on top of each other, you can find two gain knobs, one for each channel. Each channel also has a small level indicator, and the top one turns orange once the signal comes closer to clipping, and it turns red when it clips. While I like the inclusion of the LED level meter, I have to say that it's not too terribly useful because it's relatively coarse. For each channel you can also find two buttons, one to toggle on and off vintage mode, and one to change the TRS input between a line level and instrument input. As promised I'll go over the vintage mode a little later in the video, but I want to mention here that the effect is applied to the instrument, line level and microphone input. So you can use this effect on all inputs. You also got a button for 48 volts phantom power and a button to set your direct monitoring. While testing I noticed that the button blinks for 5 seconds when you turn on or off the phantom power. In that time the voltage is ramped up or down slowly and the inputs are also muted so you don't hear any clicks and pops. That's a really nice touch. The direct monitoring button has three functions, off, on in stereo and on in mono. You also get a slightly bigger monitoring volume knob with its own tiny level indicator. And on the far right you can find a quarter inch headphone jack and a corresponding volume knob. On the back you can find a power switch. I really like the inclusion of this switch and it's actually a really beefy switch which makes it very easy to turn on or off the interface. Then there is a 5 volt input which can be used to power the interface with the provided cable. This is only needed if your device does not provide enough power over the USB connection. So this can be very handy to have for mobile devices. On a computer you simply need one cable, which has a USB-C on one end and a USB-A on the other side. And that's also included in the box. You also get MIDI connections, one input and one output. And on the far right you have two balanced TRS outputs for your monitors. Before we go any further, I quickly want to look at the software and latency. To install the driver you need to download the UA Connect software. Here you will need to create a UA account to be able to install the Vault driver control. The interface works just fine without any driver under Windows 10 and up, but for ASIO support you will need to register and install UA Connect. Forcing someone to register to fully utilize a simple product such as an audio interface is generally regarded as a dick move and I would highly appreciate if UA makes the ASIO driver available without the need for registering. Moving on, I measured the round trip latency of the Vault 2 and this is the combined measurement of the input and output latency. This is important for cases when you want to add real-time effects in your DAW, like for example in Empson. Here are the times I got with 48 kHz and different buffer sizes. And here for 192 kHz. Keep in mind that the latency is heavily affected by the sample rate and buffer size, and which one you choose depends on your PC and the project you are currently working on. But generally speaking the RTL for 48 kHz is a tad slower compared to other interfaces. You can try to shave off one more milliseconds by disabling the save mode in the driver's control panel. All in all, I think these times are still fine, but I did notice that I sometimes had to choose a higher buffer size compared to other interfaces to not get any clicks and pops in my audio. But my tests weren't really conclusive in this regard, so just be aware that the driver for the Vol 2 might be still maturing a bit. The design of an interface is of course highly subjective, but I gotta say, seeing the interface in real life, it really looks great, especially with the different colored buttons. The knobs also turn very smoothly, and my only complaint is that they feel a bit plasticky. Other than that, the build quality is really good, the housing is completely out of metal and the interface feels very sturdy. A quick look inside, we find a densely populated board with familiar components. For the analog to digital and digital to analog conversion, the Volt 2 utilizes a Cirrus Logic CS4272. In my previous review of the Arturia Minifuse, I mentioned that this converter is getting a bit old and I will repeat this here. 
Despite that, it achieves a very high audio quality and the audio performance is of course not only dependent on the converter, but the whole implementation, so that's what we're going to check out next. Here you can see the frequency response of the microphone input at the maximum gain setting. This is a worst case scenario and you can definitely see some roll off. So not all frequencies are captured with the same amplitude. Would I like to see a slightly flatter frequency response? Yes. But then again, it's safe to say that you will not hear this in practice, as the majority of the frequency range is still reasonably flat. If you use less gain, like it is often the case with condenser mics, the response even improves quite a bit and is now virtually just a flat line in the audible range. And that's exactly what you would like to see. The dynamic range of the mic input is important, as a high dynamic range allows you to leave more headroom while recording without introducing any additional noise. So you want the dynamic range to be as high as possible. Here you can see how the Volt 2 compares to other audio interfaces. With 111.9 dB, it is one of the better performing interfaces, and that's a really nice amount of dynamic range. I also measured the total harmonic distortion and noise with a typical microphone signal, and here you can see a steadily descending line, so all distortion components are lower than the noise floor. Swept over the frequency range, you can see that the THD plus N stays very low, regardless of the frequency of the stimulus signal. That's a good performance and shows that you can get clean recordings with the Volt 2. Now it's time to check out the preamp performance. I'm currently using a very low sensitive dynamic microphone, which is pretty much a worst case scenario as this brings out the noise of the preamps. I'll be quiet for a second so you can have a listen to the noise flow of this setup. As you can hear, the noise is very low and my measurements confirm this. The Volt 2 has an equivalent input noise of minus 129 dBUA weighted, which is very low noise. And as you can see, this is very much in line with many other interfaces. And here's how it compares audibly to some of them. I know a few people will ask, no, you do not need a Cloudlifter Fathead or DM1 with the Vault 2. You gain hardly anything by using an inline preamp in terms of noise performance. With low sensitive dynamic mics, you might have to max out the gain, but that's totally fine as I've just demonstrated. And now the moment you've all been waiting for. Let's have a listen and also take a look at the vintage mode of the Vault 2. This mode aims to emulate a Universal Audio LA610 tube preamplifier. Sadly, I don't have access to an LA610, but Bandrew over at Podcastage has an audio comparison and you can have a listen to it there. What we can do here is to have a listen at the difference the vintage mode makes to your audio and also take a look at some measurements to expose the magic that's going on. So I'll play some audio samples and keep toggling the vintage mode on and off. There is a theory which states that if ever anyone discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it is here, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. There's another theory which states that this has already happened. There's another theory which states that this has already happened. As you could hear with the vintage mode, the sound has a bit more treble and maybe a small amount of distortion added. And I can confirm that with my frequency response measurement. Here in blue the response with the vintage mode turned off and in orange the effect engaged. You can see a rise of about 2 decibels in the higher frequencies, a tiny scoop around 500Hz 
and a small rise towards the lower frequencies. And this change in frequency response is easily detectable and makes up a big part of the vintage mode. When we have a look at the THD plus N versus frequency graph, you can see that the noise floor is also slightly higher with the vintage mode engaged. Other than that, there is no big difference until about minus 10 dBFS. Once the signal gets stronger than that, the amount of distortion rises significantly, which is not the case when the effect is turned off. What I'm a bit surprised by is that the wanted saturation only sets in at such strong audio levels. I would have expected it to rise a bit earlier. As a rule of thumb, you should record your audio levels peaking around minus 18 to minus 12 dBFS. But if you do this, the saturation hardly kicks in. So if you seek more of this vintage effect, you would need to record your signal a bit hotter than you would normally do to fully utilize the saturation goodness. You can also see this here. With a low level signal, the added distortion is very low and only really becomes audible if you push the signal closer to clipping. I find it also interesting that UA chose a very even distribution of harmonics. I've made a whole video about why different types of distortion can sound different. Tube style saturation often shows more even than odd order harmonics, which is what I would have expected to see here. But UA chose a slightly more aggressive distortion sound. It'll be interesting to hear how this compares to a real LA610. And lastly, I've swept the THD plus N over the frequency range, and here you can see that the distortion stays roughly the same, with only a rise at the very low frequencies. All in all, I might have liked to see maybe a bit more audible saturation, but with the vintage mode you can give your audio a bit more grit with a slight increase in distortion and a small boost in treble, which might be exactly what you're looking for. I'll quickly go over the line level inputs as their performance is very similar to the mic inputs. The frequency response is exceptionally flat in the audible range and the Volt 2 has a nice dynamic range of 111.9 dBA. The THD plus N versus Amplitude also looks good, with only some distortion creeping in around minus 100 decibels. There's just a small increase in distortion towards higher frequencies, but it's safe to say that this is inaudible. And I want to mention that the line level inputs on the Volt 2 can take a proper 20 dBV professional line level signal, which is not always guaranteed for an interface in this price range. Okay, let's continue on the output side. Here's the frequency response of the main output, and it is extremely flat, with only a negligible amount of roll-off in the higher frequencies. That's really nice. In terms of dynamic range, the Volt 2 performs also quite decent, with 110.3 dBA. With that amount of dynamic range, it is unlikely that you're ever going to hear any noise from the main outputs. In terms of distortion, you can see that the output also performs quite nicely, with the THD plus N only leveling out around minus 100 decibels. This amount of distortion is inaudible. You can also see that the maximum output level is a 13 dBV, which is very much acceptable for a USB powered interface. In the THD plus N versus frequency graph, you can see that the level of distortion stays low regardless of the frequency, which is also good to see. All in all, this is a solid performance of the main outputs. Next up, headphone output performance. Here is my ever growing table of headphone specs. You can directly compare values between different devices and the color help you to indicate how an interface performs in a particular measurement. The frequency response of the headphone output is exceptionally flat, even down to very low frequencies, and only rolls off above the human hearing range. The output impedance should be as low as possible, because otherwise the frequency response can start to deviate depending on the connected headphones, and this will of course change the sound. The Volt 2 has an impedance of roughly 10 ohms, which is a bit on the higher side, but I would still say that it is okay. Because of this, I wouldn't recommend to use low impedance in-ear monitors for critical listening with the Vol 2, but all other headphones should be fine. Next up, power. If the interface does not have enough power, your headphones won't get loud enough. It's nice to see that the Vol 2 can deliver quite a bit of power. Even high impedance headphones will mostly work fine and can get quite loud with the Vol 2. Simultaneously, distortion levels are kept very low, even with low impedance headphones. The noise is also very low, so there's virtually no chance that you'll hear any noise from the headphone output. The channel balance of my particular unit was slightly off, one side of my headphones was 1dB louder than the other side, regardless of the volume setting, 
1DB is just on the edge of becoming audible. But this also varies quite a bit from unit to unit, so yours might be better or worse. And lastly, you want to have a low leakage of audio from one channel to the other to preserve a nice stereo image. And the Volt 2's headphone output does this quite nicely. Overall a very nice performance as attested by the many green measurement results. This means that you can choose pretty much any headphone you like and there's a very good chance that it will work very well with the Volt 2. I think the Universal Audio Volt 2 is a two-faced interface and I mean this in a good way. On one side, if you have the vintage mode disabled, you can record very clean audio. The microphone and line level inputs deliver a low noise performance with virtually no audible distortion. But if you want some coloration, you can engage the vintage mode and then the Volt 2 adds a subtle amount of distortion and also a slight high frequency boost to give your recordings a bit more bite. Aside from that, the line level and headphone output are also well designed, offering a proper line level signal and a good amount of power to drive the majority of headphones on the market. While the Volt 2 does not deliver the highest performance I ever measured, it excels at delivering a consistently good performance in all my tests. And Universal Audio seems to really care about the details, of which one example is the soft start for the Phantom Power. My only complaint would be the price, as the Volt 2 is priced slightly above its direct competitors, and this makes it a bit more difficult to recommend. Besides that, it is a solid interface all around, not only the build quality but also in terms of performance, and the vintage mode gives you an additional creative tool to play around with. By the way, if you want to know how the Volt 2 compares to the Volt 276, then subscribe as this video will come up next. That's it for now, please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and I will see you all in the next one.